Good afternoon and welcome to the 1 p.m. edition of First Local. I'm Colette Linden for this winter wonderland of a Tuesday, December the 15th. We'd like to thank Casey Security for their sponsorship. On this snowy Tuesday morning, we are waiting for Premier Doug Ford, who will be joined by Christine Elliott, Deputy Premier and Minister of Health, Solicitor General Sylvia Jones, and General Rick Hillier, Chair of the COVID-19 Vaccine Distribution Task Force. They're going to provide an update on all the COVID-19 vaccines rollout. But first, let's see if those snow brushes and shovels are required for today, let's check our weather minute for details. Welcome back. We are waiting for Premier Doug Ford, who will be joined by Christine Elliott, Deputy Premier and Minister of Health, Solicitor General Sylvia Jones, and General Rick Hillier, Chair of the COVID-19 Vaccine Distribution Task Force. Today, they're going to provide an update on the COVID-19 vaccines rollout. As you will see, I can see in the corner of my eye there that we do have the feed up from Queen's Park. And once we see Premier Ford um, approach the the table we will throw live to Queen's Park. The city's Public Works and Engineering Services Department would like to inform residents that the McDonald Avenue and Elizabeth Street stairs are closed until further notice. The closure is necessary following a recent inspection that identified structural and safety concerns. A repair of the stairs is planned in 2021. I do see that uh, Premier Ford is uh, ready to speak and we throw now to live at Queen's Park. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Yesterday, we witnessed history in Ontario. The first Health Canada approved vaccines were given out to five heroes, our frontline healthcare heroes, and I want to thank them. I want to thank Anita, the very first person to get a vaccination in, in Canada, Cecile, Lucky, Derek, and Colette at UHN. These folks have put the community, put, them, put the patients ahead of themselves, ahead of their families. And I just want to thank you. And that goes for every single frontline healthcare worker out there that has been out there supporting all of us for the last nine months. Today, the first vaccine was given out in Ottawa to Joanne Minor, also a PSW. All of them, the nurses, PSWs, who rolled up their sleeves throughout this pandemic. And, as we saw, they rolled up their sleeves yesterday. The Ottawa Hospital has started their first vaccinations today, and they expect to vaccinate approximately 100 people. As of noon, we have vaccinated approximately 142 frontline healthcare workers, over 80 at the University Health Network, and over 50 in Ottawa Hospital. And the University Health Network expects to vaccinate approximately 325 people today, another 325 people tomorrow. Folks, I showed up to the airport on uh, Sunday, uh, Sunday evening, to watch how everything was rolling out. And uh, General Hillier, uh, what, well organized, and, and both ministers, thank you. It was just incredible how uh, the, the folks were there. Uh, I want to thank the UPS for doing an incredible job, uh, General Hillier and, and uh, Solicitor General on, on the security aspect. It was just flawless, and uh, I'm just so, so grateful. So it's a, it was a good, uh, 
good run the other night. We're going to carry on doing this and until we defeat this terrible, terrible uh, virus that we've been all living with for a number of, number of months. But the good news is, folks, there's light at the end of the tunnel. There's hope for, for everyone out there now. And our challenge is to get more vaccines, which they're, they're coming, and to get them distributed uh, across the province and get them into people's arms as soon as possible. And I just want to say that, uh, General Hillier, I have all the confidence in the world in you, in your team, along with my two uh, ministers that have done an incredible job. And there's so many people, so many people underneath the three people I just mentioned that play a critical role, absolute critical role in making sure we roll out this vaccine and uh, we do it in a transparent uh, fashion, along with making sure that we take care of uh, our priorities, which are the frontline healthcare workers. And I always use the analogy, anyone that flies, you know, you put your mask on before you put your kid's mask on. Well, that's, that's what we're doing. We're making sure that we uh, frontline healthcare heroes have their, their uh, vaccination, and then we can deal with the rest of the uh, population. Again, folks, I, I want to thank you uh, for all your support. And God bless the frontline health care workers, and God bless the people of Ontario. I'll pass it over to General Hillier. Uh, Premier, thank you. And, uh, sir, thank you for the thanks. But let me just say, and you did say it, but I'm going to say it again because it is so important. Uh, there are dozens, hundreds, and literally thousands of people making this happen in every single ministry across the government of Ontario and in every single part of the medical profession, and they've all got a role to play to making sure that needle can go in that arm with that vaccine in it and start, to, start the road to recovery that we all so desperately seek. Uh, you know, we started well. And when something starts well, I have a firm belief that you build confidence from that. Yes, you continue to learn from it. Yes, we'll have bumps in the road. But it started well. And, and yesterday to see those five people uh, get the needle put in their arm with the vaccination was actually, I've got to say this, it was emotional. It was emotional. It was an incredible moment for us. And I think everyone in that, that entire task force of those thousands of people had a little cheer, a little yay that they had helped accomplish this and going to use it to go forward from here. We have the 1,500, dose, 1500 people in each location in Toronto and in Ottawa that will receive the vaccinations over the rest of this week. It started well this morning. We expect that to keep rolling. We expect that then we, we have the second dose of, uh, of the vaccine ready for them some 21 days down the road. And when they're making appointments for this first vaccination, they're getting an appointment for 21 days after they receive it also. We expect that anywhere in the next two to three weeks before the end of December, we'll, see, we'll receive up to 90,000 more Pfizer vaccines and we'll roll those, those out to some 19 different sites across, uh, across Ontario, including University Health Network where we started and the Ottawa Hospital. We, we have heard that the Moderna vaccine is close to being approved. We don't know when it will be, but we await anxiously for it and we're ready to roll when it does arrive itself. So I just want to also say thank you. And have you ever questioned the prioritization that the government of Ontario has given to those in most vulnerable circumstances and our health care workers? All you had to do yesterday and today is listen to the stories of those receiving the vaccine and those giving the vaccine and knowing that they've been on the front lines of the war against COVID-19 for the last 10 months. They worked in frightening, dangerous circumstances and situations, and they did it because the people that they worked with uh, depended upon them truly they, their lives depended upon them and that's why they're in the front of the line and we want to roll it out to them as efficiently and as equitably as possible premier thank you thank you we'll go to the phone line for questions first question please first question is from cynthia mulligan at city news please go ahead hi cynthia hi there premier um I'm wondering what your plan is for the Moderna vaccine, which can be transported more easily. Where will it go first? Uh, will it go into long-term care homes in hot zones, for example, first? And how many do you think that you could potentially have vaccinated by the end of this year? General? Uh, so, Cynthia, yes, 
It'll go into the long-term care homes first, those in greatest need in hot zones, in lockdown zones, those who've had the COVID-19 tragedy visited upon them, perhaps those homes where the province has had to intervene to assist them through the tragedy. And, and we, we use all the data available to us to make sure we select those home and, homes in a order of priority. The so Moderna, when we get it, and whatever uh, numbers we get the doses, we'll go to those homes and perhaps some retirement homes that are in exactly those same circumstances. So we want to get at those most vulnerable first, and then, and, and then ensuring at the same time that all the workers that work with them are vaccinated also. Uh, I can't give you a figure of how many we will have vaccinated by the end of this year, because we don't know how many Moderna uh, vaccines are coming to us. We don't know when they will arrive, and we don't even know when it's going to be approved. But we're ready when they come, and we're going to move them as quickly, as expeditiously as we possibly can. Follow up. Thank you. And General, can you tell me what is the maximum number of doses? Once you get a whole shipment, I mean, we're supposed to get a, a 168,000 Moderna. I've, I know that's nationally, so on, Ontario will get its portion of that per capita. What, how many, once you get a massive amount of doses, how many per day? once this is rolled out, maximum, do you foresee being able to vaccinate? Thousands, and, and I'm not going to be more precise than that because I simply cannot be. You know, the uh, University Health, uh, Health Network and Ottawa Hospital say they can do a thousand a day, perhaps significantly more. Each of the other 17 sites to which we'll roll uh, in the coming weeks here when we get more Pfizer vaccines show up, we'll roll out significant vaccination capacity. And then on top of that, we'll start working once Moderna arrives. And once we get enough to get past the long-term care homes, we will roll out uh, you know, mass vaccination sites uh, potentially across Ontario to ensure we can do the job as effectively as possible. Here's what I would say to you, though. Knowing what we will get in the first quarter of 2021 or at, by the end of the first quarter in 2021, we've got enough to probably do about 1.2 million people in Ontario. And, and obviously, as the government has said to us, the prioritization is those in most vulnerable circumstances and our health care workers. If we total up everybody in those two categories, we have more people, about 1.4 million, than we will have, we'll have more demand than we will have supply of the vaccine. So we're going to roll it out as quickly as possible. It so much depends on the supply, and we remain committed that we'll be able to vaccinate as fast or faster than the vaccine supplies arrive to us. Next question. Next question comes from Shalima Maharaj at Global News Toronto. Please go ahead. Hi, Shalima. Hi there. Um, we've had lockdowns in effect in Toronto and Peel for several weeks now. Um, York Region and Windsor Essex, of course, entered yesterday. Uh, but we've continued to see high, even record daily case numbers. Yep. How can we believe that these measures are actually working when we are still seeing this volume of cases? Well, I always, I always look at it this way, and then I'll pass to the Minister of Health. I, I look at it as what would have happened if we didn't do it. When they, they show us the modeling and they, they're showing us 6,000 uh, potential cases a day, um, you know, that, that makes us all nervous. But uh, because, because of the guidelines what we've, we've put uh, in place, Dr. Williams has put in place and his team, uh, we're, we're seeing a, a plateau per se. And, and I guess everyone saw the numbers jump up to 2,250, and I'll, I'll let the minister explain how they've changed the timing from the reporting of 10.30 in the morning to 1. Uh, that's the reason they're, the, the jump's there, but still we're seeing anywhere from 1,800 to 2,000 cases, so we can't let our guard down for an absolute second on on this. I'll pass it to the minister. Well, thank you, Premier. And we know that um, based on the modeling, had we not done anything or introduced any uh, more restrictive measures, we would have been looking at daily case counts of about 6,500. Uh, so we, uh, we haven't achieved those levels, thank goodness. But it is uh, still a disturbing number to have the number of cases uh, over 2,000. But part of the reason is because um, two regions switched over to the new system and uh, an additional two and a half hours were counted with the case counts. So that explains some of the increase, uh, which is just a, it's just a new calculation based on going into the new system. But those are still disturbing numbers. And we do know that in some areas, people are still not complying with the public health rules and regulations. We do have um, enforcement officers out there and people by law enforcement officers 
the police in some situations because it's really important that people not get together in gatherings larger than their own household. That's how we have the community transmission that we have. That's what we really need to stop. So we're really asking people to please, please continue to follow those rules, maintain physical distancing, wear a face mask if you uh, are not able to do that, wash your hands frequently, stay at home if you're not feeling well, and please just celebrate the holidays with your own house. Household. Follow up. Um, but we're hearing about Hamilton's Lime Ridge Mall um, extending shopping hours in anticipation of people coming in from other regions that may currently be under lockdown. Are you worried about the influx of people leaving their zones to get their Christmas shopping done in another? We'll pass that to the Minister, Phil. Well, absolutely, yes. We are really encouraging people not to travel from a lockdown zone to a, a zone that ha is at a lesser level, even though Hamilton is in the red. Uh, but it's still, we want people to stay in place, stay in your own homes as much as possible, stay with your own household group. Uh, we, uh, it's, it's sort of the, the stay home time of the year. I know people want to celebrate, but this time next year, uh, will be very different. We will be able to resume our holiday celebrations, but for right now, please don't go shopping in other areas that are lower zones. That just increases the community transmission, increases our numbers, and puts more strain on our hospitals to deal with it. Next question. Next question comes from Haley Cooper at News Talk 1010. Please Hi. go ahead. How are you doing, Haley? So much. Hi, Premier. We wanted to ask you about the Canadian Teachers Federation. It's calling for teachers to be prioritized in the next phase of vaccinations, saying that they put themselves at risk every day. So do you think that they should be prioritized ahead of other workers already under consideration for the next phase? Well, it's an opportunity, uh, again, to, to thank the teachers. I, I can't stop thanking them because they've done an incredible job. Got to thank the principals and the vice principals, the schools I visited. We couldn't have done it without, without the great uh, frontline teachers and the great principals, vice principals. And got to give a shout out to the boards too, because they're, they're doing a, a great job. Um, so I, you're, we're going to have everyone calling us. I, I spoke to the, the food industry, agriculture industry, the, the, the meat packers, the pork packers, chicken yesterday. And they said, well, everyone's eating our food and, and we, sh we should be next in line. Now we'll get the teachers, we'll get everyone else. But uh, who wants to answer that, the minister or the general? Minister, go, go ahead. <laughs> Well, there will be a number of uh, groups that will be um, uh, thought of and, and dealt with by the, uh, the vaccine task force in terms of determining next levels of priority. But for the, the next while, it, the priority has to be on our very vulnerable populations, on our residents in long-term care homes, retirement homes, other congregate living sites, the staff that work there, the essential caregivers. And, but the needs of everyone else are, are high priority. and. Uh, will be dealt with by the task force making recommendations to us as cabinet. Follow up. Thank you. And my follow up is uh, for both you, Premier, as well as Minister Elliott. Um, we've talked with several experts in the field of alcohol addiction who are seeing a dramatic increase in people relapsing during this pandemic. So will there be government investment in treatment programs in the months to come? And is there any discussion about how to help these people back on the road to recovery? Yeah, that's a great question. It came up in our briefing uh, today in the multi-year planning uh, meeting, and I emphasize how important uh, mental health and addiction is for people. And, and again, I just want to remind folks, we're the first government ever to have a minister of mental health and addiction. We're also putting more money than any government in the history of this country with the help of the, the federal government too, $3.8 billion over the next 10 years. But it, it is critical. I'm hearing the exact same story and we want to be there to support these people any way we can uh, because, you know, nothing is worse than, than uh, when if you have a loved one, a family member that may have uh, some challenges, some mental health and, and especially addiction. It, it doesn't just affect the people that have the addiction, trust me. It affects the whole family. And uh, we're gonna do everything we can. It's very close to my heart and we'll do anything we can to make sure we get people back on their feet and uh, really, really help them out because it's no fault of their own, they're struggling. But uh, Minister? Oh. 
Well, uh, it's a matter very close to my heart as well, and this is something that is very serious. We've seen uh, uh, addiction rates in terms of alcohol and, and other drugs as well uh, increase as a result of COVID because people haven't been able to access their normal um, sites for support, even looking at something like AA, for example. For a period of time, they uh, they didn't have a place even to gather to, uh, to get together to support each other. So we're trying as we, even as we deal with lockdown, down provisions. We want to make sure that people can get the help that they need. So we have been expanding our uh, virtual mental health supports as well. So if people can't attend physically, they can still receive counseling and assistance um, uh, over the phone. Uh, that we know that there are people that um, are having significant mental health problems that may deal with um, trying to deal with their mental health challenges with addiction issues. So the two are very interrelated and we are putting um, hundreds of millions of dollars into this. This is a priority for our government because we do know that mental health is health and addiction is interwoven with that. Next question. Next question comes from Lorenda Redekop at CBC News. Hey, Lorenda. Hi there, Premier. We're seeing today among those high numbers that the test positivity rate today is above 5%. Yes. And we're also seeing the hospitalization numbers grow again. Yep. Uh, Quebec is apparently looking at a larger shutdown for the two weeks after Christmas. Is this something that's being talked about for Ontario? Yeah, I, I saw the same, same numbers right this morning and it, it is concerning uh, when we get into those, those percentages. and. And uh, I guess I, I, what I can say, and I, I know I've said it throughout this whole pandemic, but really everything's on the table. Our number one priority is to protect the health and safety of the, the people of Ontario. And uh, we'll, we'll listen to the advice of uh, Dr. Williams in the, in the health table, and I'll pass it over to the Minister of Health. Well, the numbers are very concerning because we see that many of our hospitals are encountering uh, some uh, surges and some capacity concerns, even though we've created over 3,100 new beds since the beginning of March. But that's why we uh, need to follow this closely. We will be speaking and have been speaking with uh, Dr. Williams, uh, Dr. McEwen, and the members of the Public Health Measures Table, uh, Ontario Health, and, and others to see what um, other solutions we might be able to bring forward that are going to help us get these numbers down so that we don't have that level of community transmission and we can uh, uh, release uh, the hospitals a little bit in terms of numbers of patients coming in. Follow up. This one is from our colleagues in Windsor. They say that the health unit there has reported triple digit uh, cases in five of the past seven days and the health unit is having issues with contact tracing and saying that today it will expect confirmed cases to reach out to close contacts on their own. Are there any support being made available so that contact tracing can happen there? There is, and I'm in close contact uh, with, uh, I've talked to a couple of the mayors there along with the people. I, I don't know how they get my number, but I'm talking to a lot of people in Windsor, Essex, uh, on, almost on a daily, daily basis, and uh, the minister would be better to answer that. Well, yes, there are supports available. We have invested over a uh, hundred billion dollars, sorry, on uh, testing, tracing, contract management. We are hiring new contact managers. Um, directly and so if there is help that's required in that area we would be happy to uh, assist them with extra uh, contract managers as well as some of the other regions that may not have high case counts are also supporting some of those other regions. I know we have some people in the north that are supporting Peel. I'm sure that they would be uh, helpful with respect to what's going on in Windsor Essex as well. Next question. Next question comes from Graham Richardson at CTV Ottawa. Please go ahead. Hi, Graham. Hi there. Go ahead, uh, Graham. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Sorry about that. Uh, for General Hillier, um, could I just get to, you had mentioned earlier about data and about uh, basically as, as the vaccines come in, I'm trying to get a better picture of how your task force is going to decide where they go. I understand most vulnerable, and I understand um, uh, 
long-term care homes that have been hit. At some point, there's going to be a choice, though, where you go here, but you don't go there. And could you explain a bit how you get to that decision? Well, first of all, by taking the advice, counsel, and knowledge of so many people who, who are intimately involved in all of those areas, and whether that's from the Ministry of Long-Term Care Homes or, or others. And so we're going to walk through it. And, and we know that the numbers of homes, long-term care homes, that are in the hot zones or the red zones or the lockdown zones are, are large in number and the numbers of residents are large there, so we're going to be quite a while before we even get to them with a Moderna vaccine, uh, whilst at the same time, in parallel, we continue to protect the personal care workers and the essential visitors and the health care workers that work in those homes. So we've got a spread of weeks, if not several months, in front of us before we get out of those red zones, lockdown zones, with the long-term care homes that are in crises and some of the retirement homes. And then we want to focus, of course, and part of our prioritization are the Indigenous and First Nations and Inuit and Métis, and we've got to look at the North. We started a planning operation this morning to shape how we would look at those kinds of operations and get to those vulnerable populations in the North. For example, we look at some of the small communities on the James Bay that you know get flooded out every single spring, and obviously we would, in, in a really good world, we would want to be able to get a vaccination program in place for them in case any kind of flooding and movement has to take place in the spring again so we don't put them into an even riskier, more vulnerable situation. So we don't have to look at the prioritization outside of those long-term care homes any further than we have right now. We've done the listing, we keep modifying it as circumstances change, and we do that based on the incredible knowledge uh, that's accumulated in the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Long-Term Care, and other ministries that are helping us reach those decisions. Follow-up? Um, I, I hear you on that, and there are parts of this region around Ottawa that were very bad in the first wave um, and have managed to bring it under control in the second wave. So if you're in a long-term care home or an area that was bad first wave, w would that still mean that you're in the first, the first in line group, or do you judge it just second wave, what's happening right now? Uh, we're what's happening right now, but one of the things we did do was for a variety of really good reasons was select auto as one of the first two sites obviously starting today to test our system to be able to put in a vaccination site and run it using the Pfizer vaccine and that will continue in Ottawa. So some of those long-term care homes who've had a tragedy tragedy visited upon them in and around Ottawa will get very early prioritization because we want to continue to exercise and set up that that process there. But we will concentrate on those in greatest need, and the greatest need is driven by the ones who've had the tragedies, the ones who need the help in the lockdown zones, the one where COVID-19 is most active right now. So that really will drive the prioritization. Last question. Last question comes from Sean Jeffords at the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. How are you doing, Sean? Good afternoon. Uh, Premier uh, General Hillier, this might be a question for uh, both of you. I, I, I want to really try to follow up and drive a, a really fine point on Graham and Cynthia's questions about the Moderna vaccine. It sounds like the province has decided that the Moderna vaccine will have to be used to vaccinate long-term care residents. And I, I gather that just simply because the Pfizer vaccine and, and the, you know, the requirements around its movement storage are so onerous that Moderna will have to be the option. So it sounds like, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that the, the, the approval of the Moderna vaccine is really going to be key yeah. to uh, helping alleviate a lot of the problems that are in long-term care right now. And has the province ruled out using the Pfizer vaccine in long-term care completely? Uh, you want to take that, General? Uh, thank you, Premier. Uh, so yes, like as of this moment, we cannot move the Pfizer vaccine from the sites where we receive it. So in this case, the University Health uh, Hospital here in Toronto, for example. We can get the workers in those long-term care homes that we really want to protect those in the most vulnerable circumstances to come to the vaccination site. But we have made a decision that to, has, uh, to try and move residents from those long-term care homes to the vaccination site increases the risk so dramatically that we would not want to do it. Uh, we, we, we've been told by the medical professionals that by doing the essential workers, the staff of the home, the essential visitors, and the health care workers that go in there, we can probably increase the protection by over 90% because that's the vector that carries the virus that causes COVID-19 into the home. So, yeah, the Moderna is going to be our first 
go-to vaccine to allow us to go into the long-term care homes. We may receive some greater flexibility on the Pfizer vaccine in the weeks to come. We don't know that for sure, uh, but we remain hopeful that that will change. And thirdly, there may be another vaccine besides Pfizer and Moderna uh, approved in the near future that could also give us that same kind of flexibility. In the interim, as soon as we get Moderna, we are going to start with vac vaccination sites in those long-term care homes. Follow-up? And Premier, maybe you can answer this. Um, you know, obviously we're talking a lot about vaccinations over uh, the, the last few days. Very important, very positive news. But we're also seeing um, the, uh, the death toll rise in long-term care right now. And uh, I think a lot of people are going to wonder what your government is doing to address that in the near term, since it's going to take months to get that vaccine distributed across the province and um, I'm wondering if there are additional actions that you're considering right now specific to long-term care. Well, there's many actions, and before I hand it over to the Minister of Health, uh, one, one action is making sure that we get the, the frontline heroes, because they are heroes, and inadvertently bringing it into the long-term care homes or the caregivers. Inadvertently, uh, we, we have to make sure that every single person is tested every single week. So you know you you, you, you got a leak in the roof. You got to you got to plug the leak, and uh, one of the leaks is, is when people are bringing the the uh, pandemic or the virus, I should say, into these long-term care homes. Uh, that's one of the critical critical areas. But uh, we're also uh, adding a lot of support through through hospitals and the and the health teams. And I'll pass it over to the Minister of Health. Well, to uh, just carry on a bit from what the Premier has just said, there are rapid tests that are out there now. The uh, Abbott test, the PanBio, which is a screening test, and the ID now, which is more of a diagnostic test. But we are doing a pilot right now, testing um, people who work in long-term care homes with the PanBio test to determine if they have any uh, evidence of, of COVID. If that uh, test comes back positive, then the, the regular test is done uh, to determine if somebody does have COVID. And then, of course, they will be asked to uh, to, uh, to go home or they may need medical help themselves. So that's one way that can, we can start to screen to make sure that the people that come in, essential caregivers as well, that they aren't carrying COVID into the home. We also are making sure that we uh, supply the staff with the necessary PPE if they are performing any aerosol generating procedures on any of the residents that they will have the N95 masks to be able to wear to protect their own health. And every long-term care home now, as recommended by the commission that's, that's studying this, um, every home is now associated with a hospital. So if there's an evidence of uh, a large outbreak in a long-term care home, that the hospital can come in, provide assistance, in some cases take over management, either voluntarily or sometimes involuntarily, to get the uh, outbreak under control. So we've put a lot of mechanisms in place to um, keep the residents of long-term care homes safe until they're able to receive the vaccine. One, one, one last note, I've been getting a, a lot of calls about the format, we've changed the format, a lot of people like the one o'clock, and uh, I, I know on social media, well, we're taking a break. I, I can assure you, all these people at the table, and for, for 10 months, uh, we, we aren't taking a break. Uh, we changed the format a bit. Uh, but we're out there, and I can promise the people of Ontario, every single day you're going to see me uh, out there. I'm not stopping through Christmas. We aren't taking any breaks at all. This is game on, and uh, I, again, I'm not leaving the office till midnight every night, so I'm not taking a break. No one's taking a break. We're going to be out there working hard around the clock. The format might change a little bit. I think they told me uh, tomorrow we're going to see the orange helicopters, which is going to be great. They're going to be delivering a lot of these vaccines. But uh, folks, we are working around the clock. And I want to thank both ministers and, and General Hillier uh, once again. Uh, we, we have a, a long road to, to haul still, but there is hope. There is light at the, the end of the tunnel. And we will get through this. So thank you, and God bless you and your families. Thanks, everyone.